Do you or your kids play World of Warcraft? Our guest left his hard earned doctorate in medicine to help create a World of Warcraft, revolutionizing the way we interact in the workplace and beyond with its massive multiplayer online workplace platform. Oh my gosh, this is gonna be such a delicious conversation. I want all the details, don't you? Stay tuned for the Start of Life live show. Let's glow. Hello everyone and welcome to the Start of Life live show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons four times founder and startup champion to founders around the world. And after raising four businesses of my own, I now share founder startup stories to help newly minted business owners find the solutions and inspiration they need to succeed. Thank you for carving out time to up your founder game while cheering on a fellow founder. You never know, you might find a new resource, tool, solution, an aha moment that can be found when you listen to another founder's story. And for those of you watching now or via the replay, I would be so grateful for your support of the show if you clicked the like button wherever you're watching because we stream live on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. So there's lots of opportunities to watch this video and watch this show. Um, those of you who are on YouTube watching, I would love your YouTube subscribe love and be sure to click that bell icon so that you get alerts whenever I go live. And this support of the show means other newly minted business owners will find this show and find a way to minimize the heartache and maximize the joy from their startup life. So thank you so much for your support and for taking those actions. Okay, so let me give you a brief introduction of our amazing guest. It's Vishal Punwani, and he's the CEO and co-founder of Sophia. And look at that beautiful picture of Sophia. This is the new world of workplace platform that powers the leading virtual world used by Fortune 50 companies and startups alike for work, social community, and events. Now, here's the scoop about Vish, okay? A medical doctor by training, all right? and a leader in tech startups and artificial intelligence. He became one of the highest rated teaching fellows at Khan Academy, worked in data and EDU at the World Health Organization, is an entrepreneur in residence with the Harvard alumni entrepreneurs, a mentor with Oxford University Foundry, and alumni advisor at Mass Challenge right here in Boston. Is there nothing that this man can't do? Oh my gosh, talk about multi-talented, multifaceted. Let's bring him into the room and give him a big, huge, hearty welcome. Yay, Vish! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> so, so happy to have you on the show. You know, it was David Chang who introduced me to your platform and I just, I hopped right on it and I felt right at home. You and the team gave me a wonderful tour. I felt like I was doing cocktails in the Tiki Lounge one minute, having coffee somewhere else. It was so much fun. And as a mom of a game design person, it also felt playful at the same time, it was really filled with imagination. So yeah. thank you for all of that. Now, what I'd love everybody to know, where are you hanging out from today? I am in my tiny little uh, closet room in Vancouver, BC, Canada. Uh, beautiful oh. here, it hasn't been raining at all. Well, not much compared nice. to usual, beautiful here. Well, I'm from where you spent a lot of time. Boston, but I'm excited to hear your journey and how you know you got and moved around the planet because you also you know, got some of your medical education in beautiful Australia. Yes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. So you've moved around the planet a lot. Did you grow up around a bunch of entrepreneurs? Was it from traveling? Like, how did you go on this trajectory from where you are today? You know, to you know, back. When you were a kid, what what did you get exposed to 
that helped you come into life and just feel so fully expressed in so many ways, Vish? Yeah, yeah, that that is a wonderful question. And, I, you know, you I think you already hit the nail on the head. It was like exposure as a kid to sort of different walks of life. So um, I grew up in Jamaica in the Caribbean, um, mm -hmm. speaking of planet roaming. Um, so my mom, you know, my mom and dad ran a company down there. My mom is, you know, Jamaican for a couple generations. And um, my mom was the CEO of a, of a company there. My dad worked with her to sort of grow the business. And, um, you know, just watching them work, like, you know, their tails off when I was a kid was just really inspiring. Yeah. Seeing how my mom handled the company and, you know, how they worked with their staff and how they grew things from like nothing to, you know, a reasonably successful company back then. Um, and that's, then when we left, that's really you know, great exposure, you know, because yeah, totally. you're watching and, and did they put you to work too? Absolutely. <laughs> I, th I thought you might mention that, but yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> My kind of family, all hands that's on it. deck, everybody. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's why they had four kids, so that <laughs> me and my siblings could all, do, you know, do a bunch of the work. But you know, we we left Jamaica when I was, uh, you know, just about ten, and we moved to Canada, and that's kind of how, you know, I first uh, got, you know, uh, citizenship here. Sure. And. Um, you know, just watching them, you know, they're entrepreneurs in their blood, right? And so, yeah. you know, obviously they didn't just come to Canada to get jobs elsewhere. Oh, elsewhere, they just like said, okay, well, let's move to Canada. They got, they sold the business and in, in Jamaica and, you know, they started essentially from the bottom in, uh, in Canada. And so, you did know, you, watching you, them. Did you hmm. go like Toronto, Canada, Quebec or Alberta? Yeah. Like where did you guys land? Much smaller. Uh, we were in Victoria, BC, okay. so Vancouver Island. So a beautiful place, you know, really small, quaint. Oh, it's it's oh, lovely there. No, it, that's gorgeous territory. I'm so happy for the, you and them. And so how did like that, becoming a Canadian citizen, how did that transition help you decide what you were going to do next? How old were you when you moved there? Uh, I was just about 10. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I think you know, a watching my parents, you know, start from the bottom and sort of do these 80 to 100 hour weeks again. It was just like, uh, you know, as a kid, I was like, oh, my gosh, like, does work ever stop? You know, and clearly the answer is no. <laughs> well, of course, it gave you a strong work ethic to go on and do what you did. But, you know, as parents of and a mom uh, of kids who used to watch us work so hard with our businesses, I thought for sure we scared the heck out of them to ever want to have a business. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, you know, it's almost like uh, something really interesting happened when I was 10 and my brother, my older brother was 11. So we'd always been super nerds, right? Like super video gamers, like tech people, hardware, software, code, like like everything. Mm -hmm. And so when I was 10, my brother was 11, we actually started our first business uh, in Canada. So we were in this it's like government subsidized housing complex and people would like throw out the most random things. And so my brother and I, we used to like dumpster dive around the neighborhood just finding computer parts and like random things that we would take apart electronics. And so what we do is, uh, you know, learning from our parents and being super, um, you know, re uh, what's the word? Resourceful. Yes. We would, we would collect parts. We would like refurbish them into like proper computers. We download all the software off IRC and uh, then we'd sell, sell the computers for a profit. And it wasn't for anything useful. Like we would just buy video games and candy essentially, but like it taught us a lot about like how to run a business, but not really, but like, you know, you learn about economy and, and things you like do, that. Absolutely. Young Cause you're retaking something, you're repurposing. Someone had a problem that you're solving because they wanted to buy something and you had a problem you wanted to solve, which is I wanted more candy. And, yep. uh, and so yeah. you saw that whole cyclical event and you tried it out That's and you went, it. okay, all right, mom and dad it. don't have it so bad. Right. Did you do anything else? Like, and did, were you, you were into games. Did you have a favorite? Like, what did you start off with in the gaming world? Yeah, I mean, we started pretty early. So I'm 34 now. Um, I, I had a regular Nintendo, like a NES, okay. um, you know, playing like Ninja Gaiden and Zelda and Mar the original Mario games and things like that. So from a young age, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. You could like enter another world and like be the hero, you know? That's right. I used to watch our kids do Sim City. And I'm yeah. like, oh my God, what a headache, especially when everything like went down the tubes, you know, the, the animals got out of the zoo and then all this other stuff and nobody got paid and the whole thing blew up. 
Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are the days, memories. <laughs> so how is it that you decided to go to medical school? Because that had to be a calling or a purpose or a seed got planted for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I always had a few loves. Um, one was obviously video games, but you never really think that something can come out of that. Right. Um, and then something else that I loved was the human body, um, you know, in, in sickness and in health. And so when, uh, when I was about 19 or 20, I moved back to the, to the Caribbean to an Island called the Turks and Caicos. Um, also really beautiful. And I lived with one of my, my best friends there. And, um, I like randomly, there's a lot of Spanish speaking people there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like randomly found this anatomy book that was written in Spanish. And like, while my friend was at work all day, I was kind of, you know, bumming around playing video games, like hanging out. And um, I just like happened to come across this book. And I read this anatomy book in Spanish. And I was like, Oh, my gosh, this is so beautiful. Like, this all makes so much sense. And uh, obviously, it made no sense to me at the time, <laughs> but I thought it did. And so I was like, you know what, like, I'm going to explore this whole like, body path. And that kind of led me down the road of, of going to medical school and becoming a doctor. And, um, you know, it, it's been a great experience so far. Yeah. And so, you know, and I just, I'll just say hi. Hey, Mia, great to see you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, Mia is an actionist. So she has a, a great podcast. Shit, we don't talk about everybody. Go listen to it. Incredible conversations. You need to tune into that. But she also is out there changing the world every single day. Thank you, Mia. And hey, Ivy, good to see you. Let us know a little more about you. Okay, so we can uh, pull that up. Thank you for tuning in to Vicious Story and learning about Sophia today. Um, yeah, making that transition, though into tech and artificial intelligence, because clearly there was something that still compelled you to go that route. And on the other hand, you know, here you are, you've gone through your residency, you've completed your doctorate, right, in medicine. You got that far, yeah. did you just get as far as practicing it? Yeah, so I'm probably about four years out of medical school. So I got my medical degree. I worked in, uh, you know, you do your general intern year first where you rotate around in lots of different things. So, you know, emergency and surgery and internal medicine and infectious disease, which is useful now, um, always useful, but extra useful now. Um, and then I decided to specialize in emergency medicine. Um, and then partway through that, I said, you know what, um, I see a huge, huge, huge impact that I could be having. Um, so it's not, you know, I, I basically put medicine on the shelf for a little bit. I'll still do a little bit every year. Um, but, uh, you know, the company and, and startup impact is really my number one. And, and what was that turning point? We all have life events, Fish. What was your yeah. life event that you went, medicine, I love you, yeah. but I'm not as into you as I am into yeah. tech yeah. and AI. You know, you had to have that uh, meaningful conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know what? Like, I think that I've always just been an entrepreneur at heart. And you know that when you realize that you were just literally the worst employee in the world <laughs> at every job you work at, right? And like, you know, medicine was great. And I, you know, I, you know, I get letters from like hospital CEOs because of my great patient care. So it's like, you know, all good on that front. But I just realized like how frustrated I would get with the processes that seem so antiquated, antiquated. Yes. And like the, it, nothing was optimized, nothing used data in the way that it should. Like everything could have been so much better, a million times better, but because of the old hierarchical legacy systems in medicine and in things like law and, you know, all the old sort of, you know, guard uh professions i was just like no i'm not gonna just like come and do this every day when there's so much improvement to be made okay. um, because other people can do that you know right see and everybody you picking up in that core agreed ingredient that every founder has it's called I, I i got a problem i need to solve it like yesterday i can't be here and dealing with this i have to i'm curious and there i need to solve stuff all right, that is the core ingredient. That's what helps founders get through really tough times. And as far as employment, I've been unemployable since 92. You'd think <laughs> I'm at an AA meeting when I people say, Andy, introduce yourself. And I go, hello, my name is Andy and I've been unemployable since 92. I <laughs> yeah. fell off the wagon once, got fired. Another time I fired myself. I mean, seriously, it's I 
totally understand that and totally appreciate that for sure. And I the just, thing is, like, you think something is wrong with you for a long time. You're like, what the heck, man? Like, I must be doing something wrong. But, but, but actually, you're doing something really right because what you're doing is you're actually listening to yourself and you're doing what resonates with you. And guess what? You only live one time. Maybe you think differently because of your beliefs, but I think you only live one time. And so you have no business not listening to what you want to do. You know, sure, it might seem risky, but you just, you're not going to be happy. And that's like one of the greatest lessons I learned in medicine is like, I've seen so many people, you know, in their final days and reliably, reliably, what they say is, you know, don't live a life that you're going to regret, right? Just if, you know, you don't want to be in my position where you're here thinking about all the things you wish you could have done. And I was like, great, thank you for the validation that, you know, and you hear that over and over and over that you're like, you know, this has to be true. And it turns out it is. It is. And if you were like, just so in it to win it with medicine, like every day, you're like, I can't wait to get into the hospital or to my office and practice medicine. You would have been looking at that person and say, yeah, this bump, I got this, but that told you, no, I got to move on. Um, let me just say hi. Hi, Tyler Hill. It is an awesome story. This whole transition, you know, we all have incredible lived experiences, but I'm really into vicious lived experience, I have to tell you. And Ivy, thank you. My name is Ivy from Kenya, and I run an incubator hub that supports MSMEs in developing innovations that offer local solutions for Africa. Ivy! Thank you. We got to shout that out. Throw in the web URL, okay, so I can bring that up too. And the man who introduced me to Vish, the one and only David Chang. Da, 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 da. And I agree, I, David. I, I so how David. do you do just a little medicine? I you? <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's these wonderful programs in medicine because um, it's really, uh, there, are, there are not enough doctors in the world. And so the, the benefit of that for people like me is that I can sort of work with agencies who say like, hey, this place needs an emergency resident for, you know, three months, or this place needs someone who works in ICU for two weeks or anesthetics or whatever it is. And I get to pick what I'm interested in, which is kind of cool. Um, and so that's that's how I do it. I that's do it a sweet. A year. Excellent question, David. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Here you are. Can I, folks, I'm going to play a quick video because we're going to start talking about Sophia. We're going to talk about how, you know, Vish transitioned and really went deep into this platform. We're going to talk about the Harvard Innovation Lab. But let me give you just a taste of what Sophia is about. So we're all on the same page. Welcome to Sophia. This is where you fall in love with work. We know working remotely has been hard. You felt disconnected from your team and spent way too many hours staring at talking squares. This is where all of that changes. In Sophia, life goes back to normal. You walk up to your friends and teammates when you want to chat with them or ask them a quick question. Use our thoughtfully built tools to brainstorm together and work collaboratively. Unwind and build team connections with game nights and happy hours. And really, just go back to being a team again. At Sophia, you bring together the magic of team connection with unparalleled productivity to achieve new heights and all while you have a fabulous time and fall in love with work. Okay, so I just want everybody to be on the same page of what we're looking at, what we're working with, this incredible, hairy, audacious idea that the Sophia team is building. So you left medicine because you listened to the people who, in their last words, say, be true to yourself, be fully expressed, and bring your truest self to the world. How did that happen? And how did you land with this team, Vish? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's there's a, there's a few parts to that question. I guess, yes. like, uh, you know, my I, we talked a little bit about how I left medicine full time and um and transition to startup life and you know last year in the mid pandemic i i could just like when we transitioned to zoom and slack i could just feel our company culture like dying and we're a team that cares so much about culture you know culture is everything right and it's not just because culture drives better business productivity and better business outcomes because guess what it does but it's because like you know culture is is 
you and your team at work. It's like how you spend the majority of your day and people spend like 80% of their lives at work. Why does it have to be miserable? Well, it's miserable if you're not like, you know, bonded to the people you work with. It's miserable if you don't like what you're doing, if you're not having fun at work. Like nobody says like after you graduate from university or high school or whatever that your life has to suck because you start working. I mean, that's typically how it works, but what happens if you ended up working at a place that's amazing with amazing culture? Like that's good for everybody. Right. And so when we, you know, mid pandemic, when we transitioned to Slack and Zoom, like there was a point after a couple of months where I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to just let our culture keep dying because I know it's going to happen, you know. And so um, the funny thing is that my teammates and I, we knew there was a better way to have a more socially connecting experience online that allowed us to be just as productive, if not more. And we knew that because I actually met a bunch of my teammates playing World of Warcraft like 17 years ago. And like we were on three different continents at the time and we still became like BFFs, right? Even though we lived all over the world because that's just how it's built. That's what it's built to to foster, right? Like, can you work together with a team, random people with random diverse skill sets, like spoiler alert, that's kind of like business. And then can you crush it together, right? Sorry for using like the startup word crush it. But no, you know, but I that, really mean it. that's what it is that you bring that team together and the vibe is happening and you hear it all the time as again, as a mom of a gamer, I hear it all the time. The conversations, this is a guy he never shuts up. They're always, always talking. And he, you know, does he know half the people like locally? No, they're from around the world and they make it happen. And that's why Twitch has been so successful mm -hmm. for gamers because mm -hmm. they get in there and they talk with folks around the world. So that's it. what was your company then before you, I mean, what was Sophia then? Was this a, a pivot that you had happen? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so before we were building this world, we were building like a totally different thing. It was actually a, a machine learning software um, for education um, that you remember, I, you know, you mentioned I, I was at Khan Academy and at the WHO and all that was obviously education related. You know, I've been I taught anatomy for a bunch of years, biology as well in undergrad. Like I really love education. And the reason why is because, you know, after I left Jamaica, I, I really feel like education is why I ended up getting to where I, I am today. It's because I got a, a fantastic education thanks to my parents. And so, um, you know, we were building a totally different thing. We pivoted because we felt, uh, you know, our culture slipping. We built the Sophia metaverse. And honestly, like our culture is better than it's ever been now. It's all, it's like, you know, I think of it strongly as our competitive advantage because of what we've we've been able to create in there. And the funny thing is that like, that's what we're trying to give to other teams, like our competitive advantage by bringing other teams into Sophia. That's beautiful. So let me just back up just a little. So with your ed tech company, that's mm. how you got you got into Innovation Labs, Harvard's Innovation Lab? You're right, exactly. Was with that entity. And folks, yeah. I just have to, I'm just gonna ask Vish to ex share with you our local Harvard Innovation Lab. We're very lucky here in Boston. We have a lot of Innovation Labs. But this one's a lot of fun. David Chang's part has been part of it as well. I know that Sonia from Zane Ventures is going to be part of it now. And uh, so share with everybody, just let's do a little shout out to this wonderful place because I know you loved it. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And I, I'm still a very active part of the community there, um, you know, helping to work with the junior teams and, you know, um, you know, attending the talks and speaking on different panels and things there. I think there's a talk coming up in a week or so about putting together a founding team and uh, I'll be there as one of the speakers. But honestly, like the iLab is is the short name and it's been fantastic for us, you know, in our early days as a company, 2018, 2019, um, we wouldn't simply, we wouldn't be where we are today without the iLab, you know, the mentorship, the um, exposure, the talent that we got, we, you know, a bunch of our teammates we met at the iLab, a bunch of our first customers we met at the iLab, like our, our current head of people and strategy used to be one of the directors at the iLab, very well known in Boston. Um, so it's just been the gift that keeps on giving for us. And it doesn't have to just be Harvard anybody, okay, out there. you There are innovation labs around the world. You can do them virtually. They will up your game. They will have different eyeballs on your business, give you the connections and the resources that you need as a new founder that you may not have because you've never been connected in a startup world or even maybe perhaps even in a business world. So thank you for that. And anytime you can join and apply folks to these type of labs, they're, they're usually free, right? Yep, 
Yeah, yep. the Harvard one for sure. Yep, is. you're accepted into that. Same thing with Mass Challenge and E for All. These are phenomenal organizations that some don't, you know, do not take equity in your business for the experience. You don't really want to go with those folks unless it's super big um, and worth it. But you, you know, you get mentors and you get advice and you get people who really help you hone your skills and step more fully into your founderhood. So had you met your co-founders before you launched your ed tech business? You mentioned a little bit yes. about playing World of Warcraft with some for many years. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll just quickly jump back to what you're saying before about the mm -hmm. iLab. Like, you know, one of the most beautiful things about um, innovation ecosystems like that isn't even, I mean, the mentorship is great and, you know, the connections are great, but like the thing that will last you for the lifetime of your business and probably for your entire lifetime is meeting the other founders that you you uh, end up being the contemporaries of. Um, so I have, you know, from my time there when we were like in the various programs there, still one of the most valuable resources that I connect with every two weeks is I have a standing call with the other CEOs from the program there. And, you know, we talk about the business issues that we're facing. We talk about the things on the horizon. We, you know, it's a really tight knit group and we always, because we're moving through our business lives at the same pace, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're always talking about things that are really important to us at the time. And, and we all seem to understand it. So it's really the founder community that will last you forever. Yeah, that's incredible. And so folks, you take that in and, and now you've got this support group because you're going to learn from the other founders, just like we do here in the Startup Life Live show. You hear these founder stories and you get to know them and you start following them. You hear things that help you have a better experience with your startup life. Um, then, yeah, but let's go now return to this, the big pivot that COVID created. I, you know, yeah. I'm just like blown away by that because now you're seeing that you've really identified that your culture, your ability to create meaningful connection and collaboration and community within your culture. How did you make that decision as a team to go? <laughs> yeah. That's that's my car steering sound, guys. I don't have, I, sh I need to put one in here, but you know, you just go, mm, we're going to go this way now, everybody. Was everybody on board with that? You know, it, that I, and I, I'm glad that you're raising this because um, it's been really interesting. Like uh, in the early days, everybody was super bought into our, our other vision about the, our prior business's vision about the education. We were building like this Spotify for education. That's what we called it. So that every person on the planet could like just nominate what their educational goal was. And like, we'd build them this crazy dynamic playlist essentially from internet content to get them there. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine how attractive that is from machine, like even from a data problem point of yeah. view, but from a, a social mobility point of view, because it doesn't matter where you live, you could always have access to the best in the world um, from an education point of view. And so, you know, pivoting that we had like to realign investors, our angel investors, um, our team, our, uh, you know, executive team, our advisors like our customers like all of these people up and down the chain within the old business we had to realign them but it was actually pretty easy um, once we got clarity on what we were doing and the reason why is because you know the growth curve and the impact and the need was impossible to ignore and so once we saw that it was going to be a runaway business um, we decided to fully lean into it and we at the time the team was like 14 to 15 people and uh you know we pivoted reasonably nimbly um we got it you know we got everybody refocused within a couple of weeks and we went full speed ahead and and now you know we built in five and a half months uh what it's taken some others like 18 to 20 months to build can everybody let's just take a moment <laughs> praise Sophia team like they should be praised that's incredible the, the team is really great the team is really talented. Yeah, but you also had to do, you know, your vision, you needed to share with, as you said, not just with the team, had to come together in their moment of collaboration and community and say, okay, we're in it. But then you had to take, look to the people who bought in, you know, invested, became owners of your business and say, oh, um, by the way, we're going to go do this now. <laughs> This is so that is an incredible story that you had to sell, an incredible vision that you had to sell to everybody. So I'm really blown away by that. And then now you have to go through the whole process again of and everybody knows this is so important in the startup world. 
you have to prove that value prop, everybody. How did you and the team say, yeah, you know, this is what somebody will want because we've had this great experience does not mean, Vish, that anybody else wants that great experience or even can have that great experience doing what you're doing. So you had to prove that. How did that go for you guys? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I will tackle that. I just want to go back to something that you said. Sure. Sorry, I keep doing yeah, that. no, I and love that. Bring it on. You know, just realigning the the investors. And I think like um, the best investors, particularly early on, are the ones who like are backing you as a founder, right? It's not about the business. Sure. I mean, it's kind of about the business, but like it's more about you and, and your team and like how nimble are you? How agile are you? How resourceful are you? How resilient are you? Like, are do they have faith in you as a person that you're going to find the right thing and then build you know, build that, like, do they trust in your judgment enough? Like, those are the types of people you want supporting you early on. And so, you know, for us, we'd really been super selective about who we brought in as angel investors early into the other business. And my God, I can't even like, I can't even overstate how important that was in the pivot. Because the thing is, you don't really ever have certainty in the early stages of things. So like, imagine what kind of crazy fall you're setting yourself up for if you get a bunch of unaligned investors on your on your uh cap table right it's like bad really yeah. really bad it, it becomes so, like a exactly so cold yeah. on your business that's it and so for us you know really fortunately every single investor was like you know we invested for you guys and you guys are clearly figuring it out so this is wonderful let's do yeah. this um it, so it was, it was pretty simple all things said and then to go back to your your question about um, proving out the value prop, I mean, it kind of sounds silly uh, when you think about it, but like we kind of knew right away that the value prop was super strong and it's because of why we built the software, right? Like it, it all comes back to the why. Like we didn't build it to like compete with Clubhouse and be the social thing. Like we didn't build it to like, you know, just be a place where people came together to play games. It was actually a place that was designed to help my team, right, get closer as a team so that we could be more productive together. And sure, part of that is like playing games, but part of that is like all of like the X factor of like, how do you bring your team closer together so that you all, you all, um, you know, do better work together. Um, and then once we saw the transformational effects it was having on our team, we're like, you know what, we're going to like bring a bunch of other companies in here and just kind of see what they think. And it, it's been blowing everybody's minds. Right. And I mean, so, like, I don't mean to sound. Yeah, yeah no, no, but give an example, because, I, you know, you get somebody who has a team and say, OK, we'll try it. I'll go to the Tiki mm -hmm. Lounge and and Mia, if you're still uh, listening, you know, clink, clink. Right. You and I could have some good times there and get some work done. You know, solopreneurs, we could all meet together and say, listen, we're going to jam for four hours. Let's do this. Um, mm -hmm. But how did the, the teams that you brought on that worked for large corporations, what was their experience? Yeah, I mean, it's basically they feel this is what we're hearing from them directly. They feel like they're back in person again. You know, we now refer to our conversations inside the world as like in real life because that's how different it feels from a Zoom call, right? The first thing you'll notice is like, Jesus, this is not anything like Zoom. This is not anything like, you know, these other softwares that make us really feel like remote, right? The intent isn't to make people feel like they're remote. The intent is to be like, can I really connect with these people? Doesn't matter where geographically we are, right? And that comes down to like, are you letting people express themselves, right? From an individual perspective, are you like, it's not just about like changing your background, but like, are you really able to feel like you're expressing yourself through like, like emotes and hugging your colleagues and like dressing up the way you want and changing your hair color and all of that stuff, right? Um, <laughs> it's true, everybody. You embody like and and you move. It, it's just as if you had taken on the avatar from your favorite MMO game and <laughs> you know got in there and started playing. It opens up your brain. I have this is what I imagine, and my experience was it opens up your. I guess it gets both sides of the brain working. You're able to collaborate. You're able to have better conversations because there's movement. And really, since rework was written in 2000, what, five? It's great a great book. book. Yep. Folks, if you really want to understand what remote working is all about, some, this is the glue that will hold everybody together. I am so excited for that. And so we're, you know, along with that value prop, I got to talk about it which is how do you know how do you charge for this how do you create the revenue model for this to get people so that you know you're going to monetize it 
and people still have a great experience, whether it's for an event. You know, I have a monthly pitch event here. I co-host with Andy Jack here in Boston, Founders Live Boston. What a great place for us to go and meet afterwards or even totally. have the pitch event or versus you've got the work online capability. Yeah, no, we've got lots of pitch events that happen inside the world nowadays. And so it's really a cool thing. I mean, it does panels and broadcasting and all the things. So um, totally, you're more than welcome. And, uh, you know, from a revenue model perspective, we um, our enterprise side for, for companies, um, big or small, is we do a, a per seat kind of like Slack. So, yeah. you know, you add people to your team and you get your own office and you can customize it. You can, you know, move in and, and, and you know, well, it includes all the video and the chat and all of that stuff so walk us through like a typical like what would be a, a a fun experience for a team let's say they got together and they've got to you know pull a strategy together for a campaign they're working on where do you see yeah. you know what's an example of where they might go yeah i mean so we i guess i could walk you through a typical day in the life um in yeah. our company um at the world. clearly i know that the best inside our, our beautiful library um, so our, our library, our office space was modeled to cut, look a little bit like a cross between the main Harvard Library and uh, the Boston Public Library. Um, so if you ever get a chance to come visit our office, you should, and uh, it'll bring back all sorts of nostalgia for you if you if you lived in Boston. Um, in terms of our days, you know, we we start each day with like a, a team meeting. Um, for the teams who who need to be there um you know there's there's uh collaboration on what the goals of that meeting are there's the whiteboarding there's the screen sharing there's the document sharing that needs to happen um as part of that meeting everybody kind of gets their job and then they run off to different parts uh of the office to have their their smaller meetings that typically happen you know post a big all hands meeting um so the artists are meeting with the product people who are also meeting with the engineers and then the data science people are meeting with the engineers and the operations people are running around coordinating things and you know know what I mean um oh, and he says running around literally you can see literally yeah because as it soon as you run so up cool. to any group of people your your videos connect um so you can you can have real-time collaboration and communication without having to book 30 minutes on everybody's calendar um and you can kind of see who else is in the space who's having discussions you can say oh Colton is over there um you know talking to Jose so you know that's great I need to talk to Colton about something so I'll run over there um, so that's a little bit of the work side, but you know, we have regularly scheduled bonding activities, whether it's games, whether it's like food that we eat together, whether it's this like growth club that we do every two weeks where we, we read an article about personal or professional growth and come together to discuss it as a team. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of different scheduled activities sure. that, that automatically happen in the world. Okay. Who else is ready to just go in and have some fun? I, you know, I, again, have been in the world and just loved the the freedom the imagination the ability to go up to someone and say hey <laughs> you know hi how are you who are you what are you working on and i could see you know folks sitting down in a, a table like environment or whatever and that you have there you have so many different features are you creating more features all the time or do people say oh we'd like to have this look or this feel how do you how do you work with that totally and and i think that's the most fun part or one of the most fun parts because people are like so we're always creating you know new clothing and new hair and new styles and new accessories and all of that stuff we're always creating new animations for your characters so you can dance and i think we have like an mc hammer dance coming out soon which is kind of awesome um which is inspired by the mc hammer dance in world of warcraft of course hey you had um, me at accessories just saying right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's funny. Your accessory might be different from mine because my accessory is like a sword, but yours <laughs> might be like something a little more practical. Oh, uh, something sparkly, absolutely. Um, yeah. But yet, the the other cool thing is, I read a wonderful article recently written by Frederick, and it was a Substack article. And you had a quote in there that really ties in, folks, to the whole founder value prop launching the product scenario, which is that peop what people say is different from what people do, which is different from what people pay for. You said that. What did you mean by that? Yeah, that I think that was probably one of the toughest early lessons I learned <laughs> as an entrepreneur. Um, because the thing is, is that like everybody, like the human condition is to like not want to make other people feel bad. You know what I mean? And so like you, it, it's, it's, it can be really hard to get the truth. 
from people, even if they love you, like even if they care a lot about you and want you to succeed, like it can be really difficult for people to just tell you the truth. And so the way people vote is either with their money or their time, right? And like, it's not about what people say, it's about what people do, right? I think there's a beautiful quote from Batman Begins um, about this that says, you know, I think it was, I don't even remember who it was, but somebody said to Bruce, um, you know, your actions are, are what define you. It's not about what you say. And, um, you know, customers are no different. And so, you know, those three Venn diagram circles, what people say versus what people do versus what people pay for, those often never in, like overlap ever. Like they might even not even be on the same like piece of paper, which is kind of crazy. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, folks who, uh, you know, I thought, were like totally behind me in my business in the early days that it turns out they totally weren't. And that's like not a problem. It's just something I needed to learn, right? You need right. to validate. Um, and I think it's more of a mental thing than anything else, right? You you just have to not be afraid of hearing the truth. You have to run toward the fire and you have to make sure that your stuff gets validated by people who don't know you. Um, you know, you want people to like punch you in the face with the truth, right? It's so important. Okay, hold on. I'm feeling it coming on everybody. Here it is. You want people to punch you in the face with the truth. I love that's that. It. Stitch that on a pillow it. moment. You know, Seriously. there's one group that I, I think displays this so much better than like anybody else. And that's engineers, you know, and I don't even think like engineers get enough credit, honestly, because a lot of what they do is behind the scenes. Right. Like I get all the credit, but my God, it's got it's not me. This is my team. You know what I mean? This right? is a team thing. And the engineers being more than half the team, like what they do is every single week, even every day they're put on display. You know what I mean? Like, did you get your thing done? Like, does it work? Like it's binary, right? Yes right. or no. And like for them, especially the junior ones, like, my God, it's a tough, it requires so much resilience. And I've just the deepest respect and admiration and, for engineers. And to stay curious as an observer. So you cannot take it, you know, personally, when all of that feedback comes flying and poof, yeah. punching yeah. you in the face. <laughs> That's say, it. As an observer, I see what they're talking about. But I also want first time founders who are tuning in, Vish, to really hear what you had to say about that Venn diagram. You know, what they say, what they do, what they do, and what they pay for may never even meet. So if you're struggling, because a whole bunch of people said, we love what you're doing, we're going to buy, we're going to do this, and then you launch and you're hearing crickets, that's normal. Okay. Totally. And so that's why you've got to go out and find more people and stay fluid and flexible and get that customer experience feedback and then okay. keep reiterating and keep reiterating. So I'm so happy you brought that up along with get punched in the face by the harsh truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, Mia. <laughs> that is a great stitch it on a pillow quote. And also we have a wonderful startup community favorite right here. Steve Vilkas, how are you? So good to see you. Innovation and community collaboration. That's an ideal combination. It sure is. How are you doing? I miss you so much. I miss seeing you in real life. We'll have to go play in the world, Sophia's world, uh, and get caught up. Absolutely. Okay. So moving along, you have great investors on board? Are you still in the seed round? Are you using angel investors to move yourself forward? Are you preparing for C v VC, Series A, et cetera, runs? Where are you at? Yeah. Um, so we have to date been just, you know, so fortunate to be surrounded by wonderful angel investors. Right. Um, so, you know, many of them we met at Harvard and, and you know, Google and all you know, Facebook, like a bunch of different wonderful, super talented ex founders or current founders, or you know, just other people with deep experience um, who really believe in us and, and our vision. And so um, that's how we've been funded to date. Excellent. And what are the next steps? Because now, you know, you've, you're continuing to build. How are you going to get the word out there? Because there yeah. are a lot of, you know, remote work, let's have fun places, but there ain't nobody doing what you're doing. I keep checking them all out. I keep going, well, does that feel like Sophia? Nope. You've really differentiated yourself. How do you get that word of mouth going? Yeah. Oh, we again, like I keep saying, oh, we've been fortunate. Oh, we've been fortunate. I it might I might sound like a broken record, but like again, we've been really fortunate because you know, the, the we have this like insane obsession, I guess you'd call it, with um with presentation and with like experience, right? Like the thing has to feel 
amazing, right? Like when people, it's like, you know, the Apple unboxing, you're like, holy shit, this is amazing, right? It's like, sorry for swearing. I've been trying not to do that. Um, but like- uh, You're uh, with me, it's okay. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, yeah. Um, but just thinking about like, uh, how do we make sure that when people come into the world, they just feel amazing, right? Like immediately, like if they're having a bad day, they just smile, right? That's like our, our obsession. And it should be like that at all times, right? Not like we're like some weird like factory of making people smile, but like we need to provide an experience that's super joyful. And so going back to your question and how this relates to that, you know, we have events thrown in Sofia every day. And these are like big conferences and hackathons and, you know, community events and happy hours and team building activities and, you know, all sorts of different, you know, things. And every time we throw an event that, you know, more and more people are exposed to Sophia and then nice. like many of those people then want to throw their own events and then they have their events and then many of those people want to throw their own events. So it's like, you know, this beautiful, um, powerful, uh, positive feedback loop. Fish, it's so refreshing. First of all, all are welcome and you're going to have a great experience. And as you know, from the Maya Angelou quote, people will always remember how you made them feel. Absolutely. And there's no secret handshake. There's no nightclub business model strategy, marketing strategy, meaning you've got to have like the cloud to get in past that red velvet rope. You know, people are coming in, have some joy, have some great experience. I am in love with that. Something fierce. We need more joy. We need more community, more collaboration and celebration of our differences because it's everybody has a role to play when you're on a team. And it's not about competition. It's about collaboration. So what I see with Sophia is that you're bringing that, that fun because you know, you, you remember things, you create more incredible outcomes when you have joy and laughter in your brain. That's a really powerful emotion instead of frustration totally. and anger and resentment. Yes? Totally. Complete. I could not agree more. Could not agree more. You don't hear about that very often. And now, and are you onboarding more people? Like, how is the talent acquisition going? Because again, we got first time founders here watching and they're building their businesses. What you know, key insights can you share about finding good people to bring on board that are good for your culture, that you know, understand where your mission and vision are? Yeah, no, this is a super, super important question. Um, so like you know, I mentioned a little earlier, like I met a bunch of you know, my teammates at Harvard. Um, you know, I think probably like 80 percent of our team, 85 percent of our team I met at Harvard. Um, and then, you know, a bunch of others I met playing World of Warcraft, you like, but you kind of just have to be like a crazy beast um, with recruiting, right? And so like, I met some of our great folks on GitHub, I met some people on um, Reddit, I met some people on like, just random, like, communities online, and they turned out to be like some of our best people. And so, um, you know, from a from a hiring point of view, we're aggressively hiring now. Um, we're looking for wonderful senior engineers. We're looking for game engineers. We're looking for people to help with growth. And that's partially to keep up with all the demand we're getting, but also partially to keep up with the pace. You know, we're, we operate like a really high pace company and I love that. Um, you know, I, that's kind of why I started emergency, when going into um, emergency medicine because like, I love the pace, you know what I mean? And building a business that way is just like my dream. And so um, the other thing though, is that if you're gonna do that, you have to be like so crystal clear about the culture that you're trying to create, right? Like, in fact, anybody who's like a prospective uh, employee at Sophia, I, I have a letter that I write them and the letter basically tells them all the reasons they shouldn't join us. Right. Because it's going to be hard. And like, I think my favorite quote in our letter says, great, you know, um, glad that you've made it this far, but you should turn back now if you want to stay comfortable. And the reason why is because like this isn't a job for people who want to be comfortable because we're literally pioneering a new world of work. That's not easy. Right. You're pushing like a ridiculous like stone up a hill. And it's not even just a hill. It's like Kilimanjaro. Right. It's Everest. And so like you're you're changing one of the oldest legacy things that exists today, which is how people work, how people view like living in a zip code to work at the place that they work at, right? Like, um, so they're gonna be challenged every day. They're gonna grow every day. They're gonna be uncomfortable every single day. The pace is gonna be crazy, but you know what? At the end of the day, they will have built something that's insane and they're gonna be part of the founding team, 
right? right. And so there's a lot of um, upside that comes with getting out of your comfort zone. Absolutely. And so I just want to make sure that every new hire is, is, you know, eyes wide open when they come in. That that is phenomenal right there. And and I you know just having that um, little quick. Let me just take this in, everybody. I'm having an Andy-licious moment because you need to keep your team really crystal clear aware of how you're moving forward. They want comfortable. They know where else they, they can work. Absolutely. This is startup life. And it's kind of like what Joe Biden said when he came on board to all the White House folks. Listen, thank your families for it, for me because they're not going to see you for a while. <laughs> <laughs> We've got oh, an important man. mission. We got things. We got COVID. We got all this stuff we got to accomplish. And that's all hands on deck. You know, yeah. it's the same thing with what you, you know, you set those expectations and everybody can have that with their family because turn back now is for real. You've got to make sure everyone's on board. And founders, you really under, need to understand this is why it's such an Andy Licious moment as well. You have to have those important conversations with your loved ones so that you don't feel pulled all the time, that they know that this is a period of time where you're all in. It's like working full time and getting your graduate degree. Nobody sees you, all right, for that period of time. All hands are on deck. And it, it feels like you may have lost, you know, the person in your life, but they need this experience as well. So those of you who aren't inclined for entrepreneurship, you know, it, your loved one, needs to have a fully expressed life and experience as well. And you can't hold them back from that. So you got to work on the lack of resentment and really cheer them on because none of these big corporations and companies that make it um, come from a place of, yeah, nine to five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we have companies to do that. Wonderful. That is not your world. Where do you see Sophia going next right now? Yeah, no, it's a wonderful question. I mean, I think what our focus is, is to really uh, drive toward the unified world of work, right? And so, you know, we're in the midst of building work communities where, uh, you know, like-minded companies can interact and, you know, meet each other and have all of these conversations that they need to have in order to be successful, right? If you think about like, kind of like Clubhouse, but like the virtual world of work version, you know, and we've started doing that. So we've got um, a bunch of companies who are our neighbors in the world. And sometimes when I have like a product question or our engineers have an engineering question, they can just like run outside, run next door to another office. And, you know, if they have permission to go into another office, obviously it's all digital permissioning. Um, they it can really is a body. To... I'm like, this is because you're a little. That's it. Exactly. Right. You Your just think of World of Warcraft, goes... right? Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's exactly. running. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll be able to wear those like five inch heels that I can't wear anymore. Right. <laughs> That's exactly right. That is exactly right. <laughs> um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I you know, no, just no. kind of went there. But you're right. So they can go in and, and go into different offices and have different conversations. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately what the goal is, is like for either. So that's like a more macro thing, but like on a more micro thing. And it's still kind of macro is that like, you know, the the, the remote world, this whole transition is is really opening up a lot of people's eyes to what's possible. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you have some companies who are like, oh, we could never do remote. And it's like, well, they only think that because right now all they know is Zoom and Slack. Of course, you can't do remote. Of course, because those tools are not built for remote. It might seem like they are, but like they're not. Right. Like, what, because is, you what is the most glaringly obvious reason why neither of those platforms work? To put it really bluntly, is that they're business productivity tools. They're not team connection tools. Right. And like the the whole so like, you know, Zoom is like almost a tech demo for what we can do. You know what I mean? Like it's like a, a, a protocol for sending packets of information from one place in the world to another place in the world. Right. There's and no that's engagement. it. There's it's, no it's engagement. Not, it's not what builds a strong team. And so for us, we're like, hey, guess what? You can go remote. And like by doing that, you can unlock the whole global talent pool because you can now hire from any country in the world. And you don't need to worry about like your culture being broken down. You can actually build your culture, right? To be even better than it used to be. And it doesn't matter that you're, you're, you're all remote because the software that you're using helps to fill in all those gaps. It helps to create all those human middle moments, right? That really matter, that gives you that competitive advantage. And so, you know, for us, we're like, it's not just about replacing the office. It's about like using digital to like a thousand X 
what's yeah. possible in person. So people at some point will be like, what the hell was I even thinking? Having a physical office where I could only recruit from like one part of you know the world. It makes zero sense. And That's so right. what we're doing is really driving that change. And we know we're not going back to how it was just even no. a year ago with people sitting in traffic, all of that stuff. People are just like, mm, I can live over here now for much less money and still add value and maybe show up a couple times a month in person That's to it. the the hard asset, <laughs> the brick and mortar space. The brick and mortar. And it's you very, know, okay. Oh, I was just going to say like, you know, um, my generation is often referred to as the whiniest generation, us millennials. Um, and, you know, I'll lump Gen Z's in us, with us too, because I love them. Um, but like, you know, we, we're going to get what, like, the, so the majority of the workforce nowadays is millennial and Gen Z. So like if companies think that they're going to be able to retain and like keep the best talent when like we're moving toward remote work. And by the way, COVID didn't start this. We were already moving toward That's remote right. work. Right. And it's just the pandemic accelerated it like a billion times faster. And so like you imagine like hiring these bright kids out of whatever university, you don't have to go to university to be a super bright kid, of course, but like, you know, hiring these amazing people into to help your business succeed like if another company says oh yeah you can actually go work in hawaii for six months or you can actually work wherever the heck you want because we don't care because we're using sophia and so we're we're, we're covered on all bases um guess what company the the kid is gonna pick right it's yeah. pretty obvious right and Very. so i just think you know companies who don't adapt and become nimble in the super important way in 2021 like you're not gonna survive very long and that's okay right that that would be your choice Right. And, and also because Sophia, I know it's virtual folks, but you can still have that connection. And if you deeply need the structure of a workspace versus virtual and remote, then you'll make that great decision for yourself. But mm -hmm. for the teams that are pulling from all parts, I mean, we have, you know, Ivy tuning in from Kenya today. And, you know, that's how we are. We could be collaborating with Ivy and everything she's got going on, contributing there, Australia, all over the world. And so to have this community and connection and we need to be able to build it, you know, for ourselves and build that into our social structure. It's not a bad thing, though. I am very excited to hug in real life as soon as the vaccines totally. in, are in everybody's life, totally. <laughs> in everybody's yeah. arm. So as you've been going through... And also, you know, watching your parents struggle through their businesses and you know, and now your own experience at this, you know that there are nights that I always like to say that you're sleeping like a baby, waking up every two hours crying. Um, when you have had tough times, again, you know, oh, by the way, folks, we're going to shift from our business A over to business B here. What is a mindset hack that you turn to to help you as a founder, a co-founder, entrepreneur, get away from gloom and doom and get back on track? Yeah, um, that's a wonderful question. Um, and it's so funny that you mentioned the sleeping thing because sleep is always like the first thing that's affected, right? You're just, your mind, you just subconsciously know <laughs> there's unsettlement and like it totally messes with your sleep schedule. And one of the beauties of like moving away from medicine full time and coming to the startup life is that like, you know, I still work longer hours, but I get more sleep somehow i don't know maybe it's like a medicine thing you just sleep like five to six hours a night it's terrible for you but anyway um you know i so i, I did a lot of martial arts when i was younger um you know kung fu and capoeira and you know the stick fighting thing and all sorts of things and the the one thing that's common in all of those is they teach you about like how to think about your mind right how to like calm your mind and how to you know all of the funny um quotes that you might hear about being one with nature and things like that but it's actually true and the more that you learn to master yourself, um, you know, the more you you will succeed in, in tumultuous and, and changing times. And, you know, not only COVID, but like the business pivot was like totally tumultuous. And um, I, I really leaned hard on a lot of the lessons of discipline that I learned growing up, um, you know, doing martial arts. And so, you know, making space for myself, being kind to myself, writing in a journal, saying like, hey, you know, you're you're all good. You're going to get through this. You're going to, you know, just keep one foot in front of the other and keep doing it. And um, it sounds really silly, but it works. 
It sounds very powerful to me. So I appreciate that founder journey advice. We all need to hear how other founders are finding ways to stay sane while they're building. And, you know, Vish is clearly very excited, passionate, his team, very passionate about what they're doing. They're going to get through the hard times, no doubt. But you got to work with that mindset and bring tools into your life that will help you however it works. And I think sensei, martial arts is a wonderful way to go in flow because it gets you, it takes you out of your mind and into your body. And whenever you can get out of the future and into the present <laughs> or out yeah. of the past and into the present for how many seconds or minutes, it's so important. I love can, that. Can I add yeah. one more thing there? Yeah. The, the other thing is, you know, having rituals is really important, right? And so, you know, waking up every morning, you know, I have this thing that I do where like I, you don't look at your phone because that's a bad idea. Um, because, and not because you're going to see like bad things, but it's just because it will get your brain racing in a million different directions. And so like, you know, you don't look at your phone. And then I go over to uh, my uh, PlayStation or my Switch and I play like 20 to 30 minutes of video games. And so it's like, first of all, it helps me to wake up. And second, it helps me to like singularly focus on one thing so that I'm like not going in a million different directions every single morning, right? Um, and then I will, like I'm slowly beating all the games that are in my backlog, so it's kind of nice. But you know, <laughs> getting that ritual in, whether it's exercise or whether it's playing video games or, you know, obviously time box these things. But, I agree. Um, super helpful. Yeah, it's so helpful. I journal in the morning, sometimes it's affirmations, gratitude, of course, for what is working <laughs> and, uh, and all of that, but also just to get that flow going. You're absolutely right. You know, it's again, training your brain to pull in, you know, to move out the stuff you don't need and the chatter you don't need and help you get focused in on what you want to create and make happen every day. And finally, how has this wonderful startup life entrepreneurship journey served you professionally as well as personally? Yeah. Um, man, there's been so much, I think like, uh, uh, so I, I always come back to Steve Jobs's quote, um, which is like, when, and this I'm totally paraphrasing here, but like something inside of you just changes when you realize that you can like poke one thing on one side of the world and then on the other side, something pops out. Um, you, you just kind of learn and start to internalize more and more every single day that you actually have the ability to shape things, right? Um, but you just have to do it and, and being a founder and taking this journey and, you know, through the, the, the different softwares that we've built, it, it's all just reinforced that, right? We've actually pivoted twice to reach this company now, which is like blowing up. And so, it, it, you know, it's great that this is happening, but there's a lot of um, the journey has taught a lot about resilience and, and the things that you need to do to self-reflect to just keep improving your learning loop. Right. Um, and then That's the other right. thing just briefly is that like, it's given me like, this sounds funny, but like it, it's given me a lot of insight into like what's actually hard and what's like not that hard. So when I was like full-time medicine, I was like, oh my God, like medicine is hard and med school was hard. And like, actually it wasn't that bad, right? Because like things are so fixed and things are so known, like we can quantify to like the percentage point, like how likelihood something is to happen given all of these background factors, right? Sure. Whereas like, you know, and the path to med school is so well trodden, the path to residency, the path to being an attending, like all that stuff is like, you could quantify that like to the minuscule percentages, you know what I mean? Whereas like, in, and the human body is also relatively well known. We don't know everything, but like, you know, it's reasonably well known and there's great ways to sort of test things in a closed environment. Business is like, my God, the opposite of that. There's so many variables. It's global. There's like you you can you can have some intuition of what might work. You can have some numbers on why things might work the way that they do. But this is actually hard. And it's because it's like so much more human and humans are not as predictable as medicine is. No, you know I, mean? I don't care how good so, at marketing you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, you know, there's just so much more complexity in business and that's given me a lot of perspective on, on hard versus not hard. Boy, is that the truth. And what, what was hard when you first launched your business, first founder, first time founders is going to feel like nothing. And parents, you understand this. The first kid, you're like, oh my God. And you're one page ahead on the how-to parenting book. The second kid, you're like, whatever. <laughs> You know? yeah. It's it's yeah. so much easier. Uh, it's the same thing with the business. You get, you know, you'll get 
into deeper moments and then you got to have a you know deeper shovel but you're going to things are, that you thought were hard initially are going to become much easier oh my gosh Vish, i knew this conversation would be so so good and so insightful how may we serve sophia how can we help sophia world grow and that's sophia.world everybody go visit this website and get going how can we serve you um it's funny that you say that because like VCs always ask me like, what's your competitive advantage, right? And like, it's kind of meta, but you know, I think it's our product, right? <laughs> like we would never in, again, a zillion years go back to Zoom and Slack. And, after, and, and this is because we directly felt the culture benefits that Sophia's brought us in terms of like team cohesion, productivity, like bonding, like all of, all of those like things that are so important. Mm -hmm. And so I like, you know, I'm at the point where I think it's almost irresponsible leadership for, for teams to continue like using Slack and Zoom where inevitably down the road, it's gonna ruin the culture of the business and that's, that's gonna right. ruin your productivity. Do you know what I mean? Your team will leave, their bond to the company is gonna break every day that you use, you know, a tool that doesn't connect people as humans. If you don't put relationships first. And they're, and they're first, exhausted at the end of the day. That's it. And you know, nobody's gonna stay at a company like that. And so, you know, again, going back to your question, like, you know, I've never felt closer to my team. Um, we've never been more productive or had better culture. And again, like right now we're in five different continents and, you know, we all used to be in person at Harvard. Um, so, you know, how others can support, I think just support Sophia by supporting your own team, right? Like come move in, right? Businesses want to go where their companies can win. So come move in, come be our neighbors. I love that. Come move in, come be our neighbors. Come on, you know, it gives a new meaning to the word we work and all the other collaborative brick and mortar spaces because again, what Vish has shared from the beginning is remote work is was already here. Now it's deeper. Get on board. And also you got millennials and Zeds. All right. They have different needs than Gen than the X and the boomers. Uh, so <laughs> you've got to be also creating environments that work for them and create that cohesion. Thank you so much, Vish. I am so grateful that you came on and shared this wisdom. I can't wait to share it out into the world. Thank you, you know, for bringing these incredible insights that you've had. I've got a few snippets I'm gonna be pulling out and sharing with everyone. You really are extraordinary. Please give my best to the team, hang out in the green room, and uh, I'll see you after I say goodbye to everybody, okay? Lovely. Thanks, Andy. Oh. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Folks, come on. How great was that? I got to tell you, there's nothing like hearing that transition, right? Going from this really something that you know takes 12 years to get, which is a medical doctorate. And what Vish learned from that, and yet what he learned from his patients that were dying, which was, you know, do what you really love doing. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I love medicine, but not that much. And he went on and he found another way. And then of course the story about the big pivot, you know, he, they'd been through an incubator, they had the investors on board and it just became clear to them they needed to pivot. I love that story, something fierce. So I'm grateful that you tuned in and for anyone who's watching, you know, please share this video, share this startup story with folks in your life who could really hear and learn and benefit from Vish's advice. I can't wait to tell you who's coming on the show this Friday, moving right along because we're here Tuesdays and Fridays, 1 p.m., sharing founder stories. I am so excited for you to meet Delphine Carter. And Delphine saw the need to connect companies with diverse non-traditional talent and help women jump back into their careers in a way that works for them. Especially when we all know millions of women have been forced out of the workplace because of COVID. And so she founded Bulo Solutions. And Bulo is pronounced obviously B-O-O, -O, and it's a career and staffing platform designed to host more flexible job opportunities for women looking to stay in or rejoin the work face, workforce. So come on, please join me on Friday, March 26 at 1 p.m. to meet this amazing female founder and hear her story. She just raised half a million dollars. So come on, you know, female founders, that's not an easy thing to do. We're going to get all the scoop from her and how she accomplished that. In the meantime, I want everybody to remember, 
Here we go. Promise me you'll remember, you first-time founders, especially you're braver than you believe and stronger than you seem. And oh yeah, you are smarter than you think or know. So remember, you've got this. I believe in you. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, I can't wait to see you next time. Mwah. Wishing you a delicious day wherever you are. Cheers. Cheers.